very smart, they're very good at what they do, um, and I think that with the three installments of the nutrition seminars they're going to do, uh, it's very, very beneficial for all you guys to be here and, and take part in. So I'll hand it off to them, and uh, it's, all, it's all you guys. Awesome. Okay. Hi guys, I'm uh, Nicole Sandlins and this is Natalie McCullough. Um, I think some of you may have been here, we were here at the, the launch of the, the Road to 100, but uh, we are twins, so if you start looking at your neighbor and asking, um, the answer is yes. Uh, and we're both not by the doctors. Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. If you can't, just let me know and I'll, um, I'll try and project a little louder. Um, and we're both naturopath the doctors. We own the Natural Health Center, which is a clinic located in Pickering. How many of you guys? Oh yeah, can do that. Yeah. Uh, we created a handout, so hopefully you guys can just sit back, listen, and all the information that we're going to talk about is yeah, right about here. You so, we're at the We'll keep it pretty informal. So we're going to chat for about I don't know, under an hour, probably 45 minutes or so. Uh, but if you guys have questions throughout, feel free to ask them. We'll have some time at the end as well. But if there is anything that's pressing that you want to us to address as we go, feel free to uh, feel free to ask. Um, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a background about who we are so that you can have an appreciation as to why this is why nutrition is a topic that we're both so passionate about. How many of you guys are familiar with naturopathic medicine? Oh yay, okay, so a good, a good amount of you. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about naturopathic medicine about what it is that, uh, that we do. And I think sometimes people think that this is what they might be walking into uh, to our offices to see. Um, but uh, basically what we do is we treat health concerns using natural therapies. One of the main foundations of both of our practices is nutrition. And I always say, whenever you're eating, whenever you're um, having a meal, you can either be uh, creating disease or preventing disease. Um, so it's a really, really important foundation to, uh, to our health. Let me get into this with this. Um, our visits are longer, so we have time to dive into this. A lot of times we'll see um, uh, uh, healthcare professionals and they don't necessarily have the time to dive into the nutrition aspect of things or dive into, um, into the diet, into the lifestyle. But we have, our visits are uh, anywhere from a half an hour to an hour in our practice. So this is something that we really try to educate our patients um, so that they get the foundation. And I hope that by the time you leave tonight, um, you have a really, really good understanding of um, how to eat well, so we'll talk about the meal planning, but before we get into that, we want to give you the background as to why. Why, what, what foods do you need to be picking before you just jump into meal planning? So hopefully, um, after tonight, you'll have a good understanding of that. Let me dive over to this. Okay. Uh, in our practice, we have a couple of different treatment options. Uh, nutrition is a huge focus of it, so that's what we're here tonight to talk to you about. We do do some IV nutrients, we use a lot with, um, with uh, people to help with Stress management boosts our immune system, helps prevent burnout. It's something that we do very often in our practice. We do acupuncture. I'll kind of breeze through this so we can get to, uh, to why you're here tonight. Um, so let's talk about diet. Um, we wanted to give you guys the foundation so that we, when we do talk about the sort of the meal planning aspect, you guys know which foods you're choosing, what recipes you want to, uh, which recipes you want to choose and why. Um, as Nicole said, you know, your diet really has the ability to prevent disease or create disease. Your food choices that you make every day can either create inflammation and we know that chronic inflammation can lead to chronic disease. Or you can eat foods that are very anti-inflammatory and will be extremely protective to your health. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And there's a lot of misconceptions that when we talk about diet, I think people get like really confused. So I thought this was a really good slide. I have patients come in and think, oh, can't eat fats. Fats are bad for me. Fats make you fat. No, I'm going to stay away from that. Or, you know, I've been told I shouldn't eat sugar. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going to count calories. Uh, and then we have some of the fancier terms that really get thrown around. So, you know, we have people following a gluten-free diet, or a dairy-free diet, or a soy-free diet, uh, people going paleo, that's sort of a big um, buzzword now, uh, people with quit sugar, people who are vegan, people who are doing intermittent fasting, so like not eating for part of their day and then just having a large meal at night. So there's a lot of talk about nutrition, there's a lot of diets that are thrown around, and hopefully by the end of tonight you guys have a really good appreciation of you know, what you should be choosing, what you shouldn't be, and nutrition I always say can be so simple when we break it down. So we're really going to try and break this down into sort of easy um, tangible pieces so you guys can have an appreciation for it. So how many of you look at nutrition labels when you, um, when you grocery shop? Okay, what are you guys looking for when you're looking at labels? Sodium. Sodium, okay, yeah. Sugar. Sugar content, yeah. Okay, good one. The amount of ingredients. The amount of ingredients, okay, good, we're going to answer that, awesome. Um, so the nutrition label is an area that gets a lot of attention. It is now mandatory on, um, on, on foods. Um, that they write down what these different things are. And so there are three macronutrients that are important to know about that are on this. So anybody know what the macronutrients are? Protein. Protein being one of them? Yeah, protein, carbs, and fat. So those are all outlined here. 
Um, the big thing we want to look at when we're looking at these is where is the carb coming from? So this particular food, 26 grams of carbohydrates and 26 grams of them are coming from sugar. So obviously not the best choice. And we mentioned that sugar is something they keep an eye out for. You'd be amazed at how many foods have hidden sources of sugar in them. It is shocking when you start to look at this stuff. So definitely something worth looking at. Um, sodium is something that a lot of people pay attention to as well. Um, sodium, and we're going to talk about eating whole foods and eating foods as, um, as they sort of appear in nature. Sodium, I always say, is a barometer of how much processed food somebody is eating. If you eat a lot of processed foods, you're going to have a lot of sodium in your diet. But if you're not eating a lot of processed foods, you're going to have very little. Fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds, they really don't have um, any sodium in them. So that's something to, uh, to be aware of and pay attention from. Does anybody know what, um, what these percentages are on the side? The daily value? You know where they come from? They're, they're, um, they, the Canadian government has come up with what they think we should be having in a day as the average person um, in terms of vitamins, like calcium, um, you'll see the vitamin C on the side there, and they'll tell you how much is actually coming from, from this food. Um, it's not the most individualized approach because we do know that the recommended daily allowance for uh, you know, a woman who's breastfeeding or for a toddler is obviously going to be different from an adult. Um, but these are where those numbers come from. And one of the, uh, the things that I always get uh, my patients to really pay attention to is the serving size. Because somebody will look at a label and they'll go, okay, well, I kind of checked this out. It's not too, too bad. Well, not this one, but uh, they're not too, too bad. Um, but I'll say, you know, but how much of it are you actually consuming? How much are you actually having? The, I find this notoriously with cereal. People who start the day with cereal are like, oh, cereal looks pretty good. It's only got, you know, this many grams of sugar. I'm like, well, how many cups of cereal do you have in a day? And they'll have, you know, they'll have two or three cups when the serving size really is only one. So it's something to really um, pay attention to. Any idea what this food is? Give a guess. So it's got, it's got fats, mostly from saturated fats. Do you know where saturated fats come from? Mostly from animals. So it's got, it's got a good amount of fat, mostly saturated fats. It's got some protein, a lot of sugar in it. Yogurt. Yogurt was the guess? Yogurt. Good guess, really good guess. Um, I, I just pulled this off the internet and I suspected it was ice cream. That was sort of my guess is what it was. A high amount of sugar, good amount of saturated fats. Um, so obviously not the healthiest food choice for us. Yeah. Oh, and then lastly, calories. And calories are something that get a lot of attention when it comes to uh, people sort of eating healthier, especially in the weight loss world. We now know that there is more to the story than just calories in versus calories out. Um, if somebody eats, let's say they decide that 1,500 calories is going to be the, um, their benchmark for how much they're going to have in a day, somebody who's eating 1,500 calories from processed foods coming from sugars and white flours, um, they're going to be setting themselves up for the biochemistry in their body to basically have more cravings, be, uh, be famished, be very, very hungry, uh, they're going to be tired, they're going to be lethargic, versus if somebody has 1,500 calories and it's coming from fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and, and foods that are giving us a lot of nutrients, so a lot of bang for our buck when it comes to the calorie per calorie, right? So um, it's something I often, I very rarely talk about with my patients. Like, this is the only time I'm going to mention it really tonight. Um, I, I don't think it, calories are all that important. I think the quality of what we're putting in our body is really what, uh, what we should be focusing on, not how many um, units of energy, which is what a calorie is, um, that we're putting in and consuming. Any questions about the nutrition label? Okay. Um, so this is something, and you mentioned this, I think that this is something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. I oftentimes get patients to look more at the ingredient list than the nutrition label. I don't really care, like Eagle said, how many calories are in something, and if you're eating you know, reasonably good food choices, you will find that foods with this type of ingredient list will have to be the ones with the high sugar and be the ones with you know, lots of saturated fats and things like that. So, this is really important. This has a whole bunch of additives in there. There's colors, there's dyes. Our bodies don't really know what to do with all of this. This really sets our biochemistry up for a roller coaster ride. So I think that this is, you know, at the very least, I say kind of ignore the nutrition aspect of it and look at what you're actually putting into your body. So we really need to be educated consumers about what we're putting in. The food market does a great deal of uh, marketing just to get us to buy foods and make consumers feel really confused and you know, parents think they're doing a great job when they give their kid that sugary cereal with that yogurt and then that orange juice. Well, that's loaded with sugars, and if you're choosing the wrong ones, they're going to have a lot of additives in there. So then our kids are going to school, and they can't pay attention, and they can't focus. So I think that this is really, really important, and I think a nutrition label should really look, or an ingredient list should look more like this. 
So this is what I would call a convenience food. So these are all whole food ingredients. I could walk around the grocery store, I could pick up each one of these ingredients, come home, make that food. I don't have time for that, not all of us have time for that. So this would be something, okay, I think this is probably a cookie, like an oatmeal cookie or something, or a granola or something, I'm not sure. Um, but this would be something, this would be an okay choice. It has an ingredient list on it, it's okay, but they're all whole foods. So I know exactly what they are, I'm not seeing any additives, I'm not seeing any chemicals. So um, this would be a really great convenience food to potentially um, add to your grocery shopping. Can you guys think of any other convenience foods, okay, anything else that you buy that you think, well I know this is a process, but there, this is something that I just buy for convenience. Any kind of like bar. dried pasta. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the comic here? Protein bars. Protein bars, okay. Some of them are processed, so sometimes there's uh, there can be an element of processing with protein bars. Uh, sort of examples that sort of come to my head are things like hummus, where when I read the ingredient list, it's chickpeas, it's tahini, it's olive oil. I could go and buy all those and go home and make it, but sometimes I just don't have time to do that. So I'm going to buy that as a convenience food. Um, Tomato sauce is an example of that as well, right? So if you can read the list and you can identify where all these things are in the in the grocery store, that's always um, always a good indication that you're buying a convenience food, not a processed food. Something like the last label that we saw, like I wouldn't even know where to find this, right? What aisle would I go to for blue number two and yellow number five? Like you just wouldn't, right? So these are things that um, that just don't exist in, in they shouldn't exist in our food sources, and therefore they really shouldn't exist in our um, in our bodies. So here are some general rules that I always get my patients to start, just a different way of thinking about your food. Let's not count calories, not, let's not focus on anything that's specific on the nutrition label, but let's start to focus on eating real foods or whole foods. And that term gets thrown around a lot, but if, if we can sort of follow these rules, it really um, helps to break down what whole foods look like. So I always say if your grandmother wouldn't recognize it, don't eat it. Um, you've heard that before. In the last 50 years, the food industry has made a huge push towards more processing of foods. So if it didn't exist back then, it probably is because it's processed. Um, real food has very few ingredients. So you saw the difference between those two ingredient labels that Natalie went through before. There's a lot less on, um, on the whole foods, or the convenience food. Uh, real food is identifiable, so you should be able to identify um, when you pick up the ingredient list and you see all the things that are on there, you should be able to identify it somehow in that food. Um, there's, they do a lot of really interesting marketing things where they'll tell you that there's a serving of vegetables found somewhere in this food. They just did that about a year ago, I think a year and a half ago to bread. Um, there was a company that came out with the bread that was giving you a serving of vegetables, but like where? I don't know where they, where they are and how they're processed and what, what's going on in there. So you should be able to identify it. Real food um, does need to be refrigerated, so it will, for the most part, um, it, most things that are whole foods will go bad. So um, something to be aware of, you'll have to grocery shop a little more often or, or prep them and then freeze them, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, real food has fewer chemicals, so we just went through that. And then I wrote it's hard to find real food at restaurants and fast food places, but I would say that's not so true. Restaurants are a lot easier these days. Fast food places tend to be a little bit harder. Um, so just something to, to, you know, not to say you're never going to eat in a restaurant or fast food place, but, you know, it shouldn't be the bulk of our diet. It's something that sort of falls on that, you know, 20% we're 80% we're eating, you know, clean and, and eating well. Um, so this is a list of some foods to avoid entirely. So these are things that I think um, just set up our biochemistry, just sort of imbalance our biochemistry. So things with refined white flour. So all your white, starchy, fluffy stuff. So your pastas, cakes, muffins, pretzels. These are really dense in carbohydrates and really lacking in nutrients. So they give us lots of lots of calories, not that I'm talking a lot about calories, but they are, they're very calorically dense with very little nutrients. What we want to do is eat foods that are that are absolutely the opposite, that give us way more nutrients with very few calories. Uh, refined sugar loaded things, so cereals. Cereals are notorious for just having tons of sugar loaded in there. Candies, baked goods, uh, processed foods with empty calories and fats, um, things like uh, processed soups, uh, popcorn, chips, all these things have uh, empty calories that we don't necessarily need and they don't give us any nutrients. Uh, margarine, I don't even know what that is really, it's like one step away from plastic, so I don't think we should really be eating that. Uh, butter and shortening, these things are really high in saturated fats which are not great for us. Uh, smoked or cured meats, the World Health Organization uh, put out a, a notice last year that um, smoked meats are potentially a known carcinogen, so known sort of cancer-causing agent. So we definitely should not be putting that into our bodies. Um, 
heavily sweetened or artificially sweetened things, so soft drinks, Kool-Aids, anything that has um, aspartame or uh, artificial sweeteners, that really sets our, our biochemistry up for a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, they've done some studies that people who eat artificially sweetened things actually end up gaining more weight because their body's anticipating them to metabolize something, so your, your appetite goes up. Um, they did a study on that uh, with Diet Pop, and people who were drinking Diet Pop actually started to gain more weight than those that actually drank the regular Coke and had the regular sugar. Um, and then fried foods. Uh, we want to try and avoid those as much as possible. So french fries, potato chips, corn chips, donuts, all that kind of stuff. Um, these are some tips for when you're grocery shopping. So this is sort of part of that meal planning piece, right? We want to make sure that, uh, that we're picking the right recipes and we're going to talk about that. But these are some tips to keep in mind, and I'm sure you guys have heard these before. Uh, number one is shop the perimeter of the grocery store. That's where all of our whole foods are kept. That's where the fridges are. That's where the stuff that goes bad is. There's very little things we need to grab from sort of the middle aisles. Maybe some, you know, dried beans and um, quinoa and your grains. But other than that, most of your shopping should be sort of done on the perimeter. Uh, go with a plan. And we're going to talk a lot about this. This is absolutely key. Um, if you don't have a plan, you'll buy all kinds of stuff and then you'll get home and you'll have all the elements of healthy foods in your fridge, but if you don't know what to do with them, they're going to go bad. Uh, you end up spending a lot more money at the grocery store. Um, don't go hungry. We've all heard this. You're just going to put things in the uh, grocery cart that you don't necessarily want. Um, if you have little ones, try and leave them at home if you can so there's not the temptation of them crying for whatever cereal they want. Uh, and then we've talked about this, so choose real foods. So this is really, really important. Uh, read the labels, so hopefully you guys have an appreciation of both the ingredient list and the nutritional facts that we want to look at. Um, try shopping with the seasons. Um, this is a great way to cut down on your produce bill um, and to try some different, uh, some different vegetables, fruits and vegetables. Uh, think of the grocery store in terms of departments. So this is an easy way when you are meal planning and putting your grocery shopping list down. Write out like what you're going to grab from the produce section, what you're going to grab from the dairy section, what you're going to grab from the meat section, so you're not looking at your list and forgetting things and running back and forth in the grocery store. So I think this is a really important piece when you are planning and sort of outline your um, outline your grocery shopping list based on that. There's some apps that'll do that for you too. Yeah, you can just sure. plug in your, your food choices; it'll separate it for you into the right um, categories. Uh, buy organic if possible. Um, you know, when you're buying organic, you're not getting the heavily sprayed um, with herbicides and pesticides. You're also eliminating the genetically modified organisms, so you're avoiding all the GMOs, which I think is important. Um, if buying organic is not feasible for the entire diet or for the entire family, there's a really great list. I don't know if anybody's heard of the list by the Environmental Working Group, the Dirty Dozen list and the Clean 15 list. Um, it's a list that they put out every year that lists the most heavily sprayed fruits and vegetables versus the least sprayed. They have an app you can download on your, on your smartphone, so you can get that when you're grocery shopping, which is a nice thing. Um, and then there's some really great uh, places where you can get organic produce. So there's a lot of home delivery services which make it way more affordable than buying it from the grocery store. Um, they sort of cut out the middleman and go direct to the farmers and then we'll deliver it to your house, which is a nice, um, cheaper way, more economical way of getting uh, organic. Uh, and then have fun with the grocery shopping and the meal planning. This doesn't have to be stressful, and we're going to talk about how to hopefully make it quite easy. Um, this is just some sort of grocery shopping tips when you are at the grocery store. So to think big when you're choosing your grain products, your whole grains, your quinoa, your buckwheat, your millet, all of that, uh, your vegetables and your fruit. Think smaller when you're using your meat and alternative uh, food groups. And then think carefully when you're choosing your fats, your oils, and then I would argue that sugar needs to be removed from that um, picture. So I want to talk about some staple items. So when you're at the grocery store, what are some things that you should really load in your cart with? And I think the biggest one is the fruits and vegetables. Natalie showed you the grocery cart and how the, the big part of your basket really should be predominantly fruits and vegetables. Um, you can't really go wrong in this category. Natalie's going to show you a food pyramid that's going to help to break this down for you. Um, the leafy greens should be our biggest emphasis. Those are the ones that give us the most nutrients. Um, relative to some of the other fruits and vegetables, and then from there, just supplementing with uh, a whole bunch of different colors in that in that uh, in that grocery cart. Um, the other things you want to get is some um, some healthy proteins. So these can be vegetarian, which we'll show in a moment. But they can also be from animal sources. So eggs are a great um, complete protein. I recommend these all the time. Um, you can do salmon. There's different types of salmon that you can get. Some are better than others. Um, Alaskan salmon is usually the one I recommend to most of my patients. Sockeye salmon. It's got um, uh, lower amounts of mercury and lower amounts of uh, industrial pollutants in it. Um, so that's usually my, my recommendation when it comes to salmon as opposed to the, um, the, the Atlantic. 
Um, and then you can get some red meat, so you can you can safely eat red meat. I think we don't need to um, we don't need to overdo it. But if we're getting lean cuts, um, one of the things that I often recommend is um, when you're making a meal, like if you're making a stir fry or you're making um, a one pot dish, to try to cut back on on some of the meat consumption and su uh, supplement it with some vegetarian proteins as well. So we're so quick. We talk about the importance of protein, and you're all training, you're all working out. It is an incredibly important piece. But it, we, we tend to go to the animal source first, and it doesn't necessarily have to be from that. There are some great um, vegetarian sources that, uh, that can help with that. Uh, so these are some of your vegetarian sources of protein. So you have your beans and legumes, some of your nuts and seeds. Hemp hearts are probably one of my favorite um, vegetarian sources of protein. They're really great uh, in terms of throwing them in a smoothie or sprinkling them on a salad. You can get quite a, a good amount of proteins um, from them. But this is, I think, something that, that we don't add enough of into our diet. And, um, I oftentimes am encouraging patients to have, you know, two to three days a week where you're, you're eating nothing but vegetarian, and I think that's a really health-promoting um, diet. Uh, we, we always think, as Nicole said, think about the meat first and then sort of line up our vegetables, but it's a nice way to think about, about the alternative, and you can get enough protein from your vegetarian sources. We have enough, uh, and then sometimes when, you know, you're questioning whether you're getting enough, that's where protein powders and things like that come in handy, and you can just dump that into your morning smoothie, and you got your protein in the morning, and work on your vegetarian sources later in the day. This I found, and I thought that this was a really great food pyramid. So you guys have all seen our Canadian food guide, and it's very heavy in grains, and it's quite heavy in dairy. Um, but I like this one a lot better, because the emphasis is on the leafy greens. This is a raw food diet pyramid, not that everybody needs to eat raw foods, but I like the emphasis on the leafy greens, and sort of separating those away from our other fruits and vegetables. So we should really be having tons of those, at least two to three servings of our dark leafy greens a day, then our other fruits and vegetables, then we can have our um, sprouts and legumes, our nut seeds and hemp hearts, uh, some of our microgreens, which are extremely health promoting, so our um, seaweeds and our wheatgrass, and then some of our oils. Uh, so I thought that this was just sort of a nice uh, depiction of some, some of a different way of thinking about our, about our foods and which ones we should be having a lot of and which ones we should be having less of. Um, I think we've said this enough, but eat whole foods. Uh, buy whole ingredients. I don't look at an apple and ask myself what's in it. I don't grab a sweet potato and go, gosh, what is, what is this I'm eating? They're, they're whole foods in the way sort of they were in nature. That's what we should be focusing on. I think this point is the most important. You need to cook. And that sounds blunt and that sounds like in your face, but if you don't know how, you need to learn. We get asked constantly from people will be out in social situations or wherever we are, people will say, you know, what's the number one supplement you can take? Like, what, what, what's the big thing that you're taking right now that everybody should be on? And I'm like, it doesn't come down to a supplement. It comes down to your food choices and you need to eat whole foods and you need to cook. So if you need resources, and we're gonna talk about some resources, there's some great cooking classes available, um, but this is probably the single most important thing you guys can do for your health. Uh, you guys are all obviously way ahead of the curve. You guys are doing the, the challenge. You guys are committed to exercise and healthy living. And I think that this is a huge, huge, huge component of that. It doesn't uh, have to be hard either. That's the thing yeah. with cooking. I think a lot of people think it takes a lot of time and it's difficult and it has to be really involved. It really doesn't. You can make really, really simple meals that'll take you a fraction of the time of what you're probably thinking or as some more involved uh, recipes will take. So this doesn't have to be a time-consuming thing. Uh, and then you need to set time aside to meal plan and prep. So generally about two to three hours is what it's going to take you in a week. And we'll walk through what sort of a sample week looks like. So um, it doesn't take a ton of time, but if you do, if you spend two to three hours on the weekend or Sunday or whatever it is, you've got all your meals for the weekend. The rest of the week is, is easy breezy. If people, you know, I have patients all the time are like, oh my gosh, I work late. I take the GO train. I get home at 7 o'clock. I got to deal with the kids. And then you want me to like make this healthy meal? Like forget about it. Um, but I think if you can do it on the weekend, then it just makes it so much easier and it can really um, set yourself up for success. If we don't have a plan, then you're going to fail and that's that's really is the reality and I'm guilty of it. If I don't have a, if I haven't planned for the week, I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to eat this week? And it's, I'm throwing things together. So if you can really set time aside on the weekend to plan out your week, you'll really set yourself up for some success. Um, so set yourself up for success. So these are sort of some really simple tips. I always say pick out five to six recipes for the week. Plan for leftovers and any meals out. So look at your calendar, look at if you have any work events or social events with friends and you're gonna eat out and that's totally okay. Uh, keep it simple and then set aside two or three hours per week to cook. Um, let's walk through. Um, this was some recipe resources. So these are some places uh, to find some good healthy recipes. 
Miko and I have pinned a whole bunch of, if anybody's on Pinterest, we have tons of Pinterest boards with tons of recipes. So those were just our Pinterest accounts that you can just go and follow the different boards that we have. Um, but you'll find tons of great recipes there. We have some on our food blog. And then these are sort of my three favorite food blogs. And they're on your, ha on your handout. Um, the first one is oshiglows.com. That is, um, she's got a great cookbook coming out with a new one soon. Uh, it's vegan. Not that everybody needs to be vegan, but you can, you know, it's a nice way to get those vegetarian meals into your diet and try and use that for the couple of days a week that you might want to uh, focus on vegetarian meals. I'll often get my patients when they go to Oshi Gloves and get some of these vegan meals to uh, add protein to it. So if they want to have an animal protein and they want to add chicken to it, I'll get them to do that because I think I don't think that it, we need to have every meal that's vegan or vegetarian, um, but they're they're really nice, simple, uh, tasty starters. Uh, so they kind of give you a baseline to, to start your meal and get a, a, a framework for thinking about what you're going to eat that day. The second one is nourishingmeals.com. This is all whole foods based. It's dairy free, gluten free, soy free, refined sugar free. She's got two cookbooks, but her blog has tons and tons and tons of recipes. For anybody who's cooking for family, she's got five kids. Um, so at the top of most of her recipes, she'll tell you which recipes are sort of kid friendly and you know, my five year old loved this one. And, uh, so it gives you some nice uh, family meals on that one. And she does use some meats in there. And then Cookie and Kate is a nice one as well. Um, so hopefully that gives you sort of a starting point and I, you know, oftentimes with the Pinterest I just will pin a whole bunch of recipes and then on Sunday I'll pick out my five to six recipes, write out my grocery shopping list and then go shop based on those, on those recipes and then come home and cook them on, um, on Sunday. And when you're picking your meals I would say if you come up with a plan for a week and your family likes it or you like it and it was simple and it was easy, you can just replicate it from week to week. You don't have to go through the whole exercise of finding new recipes every week. If you want to have, you know, a standard household where it's, you know, taco night on Monday and whatever it is on Tuesday and you rotate through those, that's always a really easy way for, for busy families to just um, have meals prepared. There's no, it takes the guesswork out of it. And then your grocery shopping ends up being um, pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Sometimes I have people want to make it a little more exciting. And then I say do four weeks and then just rotate those four weeks. So you're, you're getting a new week and like the planning is done and you have it laid out for yourself and you just rotate. Um, this is what I normally recommend. So here's what we sort of need to plan for. So for breakfast, I would say keep it simple. Have two to three breakfast recipes that you like and just rotate through them. And on the next slide, I'll talk about some breakfast recipes that are good. Um, lunch, I say don't even think about lunch, just make extra dinner. And then all you need to do is just pack leftovers and that's easy. You don't even have to think about that meal. And then for dinner, focus on simple, easy recipes. So slow cooker recipes are great. You can let the slow cooker come home and dinner is done. Uh, and then like I said, cook one day a week. Um, I find when I'm cutting, you know, onions for one recipe, I might as well do it for three because I already have the knife dirty and the cutting board out and it's just so much quicker than going through that every night. So if you can sort of cook your, if you can cook everything on the weekend, great. If not, at least prep everything. So if you know that one night's going to be a stir fry, cut up all the vegetables, have those cut and in your fridge. So all you're doing when you get home is cooking and not preparing. So that prep work is what takes 20, 30 minutes. Whereas it just coming home, dumping the veggies in a, in a pan and away you go. Uh, so that can really make it simple and make it easy for yourself. Um, these are some sort of, this is sort of a sample week. So some different breakfast recipes that would be great. So I'm, I'm constantly recommending smoothies to patients. I think this is a great way to start your day. You can get a good protein in there. You throw some greens in there and get some really healthy um, leafy greens and then get your fruits. And it's not very carb heavy, but will make you feel fuller for longer. So this is a really great way to start your day. You can do a vegetarian omelet, uh, or if you're okay with dairy, you can do Greek yogurt, fruit, and then some different nuts and seeds on there to make sure you're getting some of that protein content. Like I said, lunch, we're gonna do dinner leftovers. Just keep it simple for yourself. Just make extra, and that's your lunch. Uh, and then you always wanna prepare for some snacks, so cooking some different things um, that you have ready. So you can do like raw energy balls. If you, we have lots of recipes on our website for that, where you just use like nut butters and hemp hearts and different things like that. They're really great. You can make a bunch of those and keep those in the freezer. Uh, they're, they're nice because they're, nice they're high in protein, and if you yeah. have a protein powder too, sometimes I'll have patients that'll actually add their protein powder to them, yeah. so they're increasing the protein content if that's something they're, they're trying to be mindful of. Uh, you can do veggies and hummus, you can make a vegetable soup, um, these are all some different snack ideas. For snacks, I think we get stuck in a, a thought about like, oh, but what about like my granola bar, or what about like my snacky food, and I always say, you know, when we think about sort of quick, convenient snacks, they tend to be kind of junky. Uh, so I always say think about snacks as mini meals. Like nothing to say you can't have, 
you know, a smaller portion of your dinner leftover as a snack. It doesn't necessarily have to be this traditional like crackers and cheese or whatever we're sort of used to. Just think of them as mini meals. So that's where sort of a, a vegetable soup or like a chili or something like that, you just have a smaller portion of that and that would be a really great, uh, really great snack option. Um, and then this is sort of a sample week. Um, so I just threw this together in terms of uh, some different recipes. I believe I have put that on your handout, so you guys have that there. A lot of these recipes are on our website or from some of the websites I was directing you guys to. Um, but this is what a good week would look like. You know, you're probably going to have one night out, and that's okay. You're allowed to go out for dinner, um, and then you sort of can plan all this. I typically, this was I believe a slow cooker recipe. I typically will do at least one or two slow cooker recipes in the week just to keep it really easy. I'll cut everything on Sunday, put it in the slow cooker, put the slow cooker in the fridge uncooked, and then all I'm doing in the morning is putting it on the bottom and turning it on and I walk out the door. So it's just keeping it really simple, especially midweek when we're super busy. For something like this stove top tandoori, I've done it where I've cooked the chicken and it's ready for Monday, and then I've already cut the uh, broccoli and it's already in a pan just ready to be thrown into the oven. Uh, vegetarian curry with organic tofu and brown rice, I would have already cut up all the vegetables and had that ready to go. Um, this one was a slow cooker. Uh, lettuce fajita wraps are super easy to throw together. Um, So hopefully that gives you guys sort of a, an appreciation of sort of that meal planning piece. I think that this, like we said, this is a really important part to your training. You guys are all working really hard and I know you want to make sure you get to your goals. And exercise is phenomenal, but diet is so important. I see it all the time and I'm sure the trainers can maybe attest to that, that you know people work so hard and if you don't have that nutrition piece in check, you're just not going to get to the goals you want. You might be stronger, but if you want to you know, lean down or do different things, it's going to be hard if the nutrition piece isn't there. So I think that this is hopefully such a nice compliment to what you guys are doing. Um, I think that's all we wanted to chat about. Any questions about any of that stuff? Any more handouts? Oh, oh, are we out? Are we out? Yeah, you're over here. here. You guys don't have any more handouts. Uh, we can send you the I can PDF. send you I can send it to you and you can email it out. Yeah, there's some there. Sorry. Do you guys all think that? Oh the photos I Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering too. Why is it taking pictures? Uh, I'll email it to Kevin. Sorry, I didn't realize we're We can send a slideshow to you. I can send a slideshow if you guys want as well. So I'll send you the PDF so you can fire it out to the group. Um I have a question, it's just a conversation over here. Um I'm a, I always tell everyone, you know, as you guys know, we, we promote athletes' plate meals to everyone, yeah. whether they're you know, our adult clientele or professional athletes, whatever. Um, how important is uh, protein and how much protein should our active adults be eating in a day, whether it's plant or animal based? Yeah, so generally anywhere for your meals, you want to get 15 to 20 grams at least in your meals. For your snacks, you can get about 10 grams of protein. 5 to 10 depending on the sort of the size of it um, and then there's a, there's a weight calculation based on your your body weight so it would be a little like somebody who's 120 pounds versus somebody who's 180 pounds their their protein requirement would be different um, roughly what is a few mass it's about 0 0.8 to 1 gram uh, of protein per, uh, per kilogram of body weight it's usually that's how it works yes yeah, yeah. Um, is usually what uh, we recommend, or, or above that. That's sort of your minimum. Like that's kind of the lowest you want. And when you're when you're an athlete, it's really important. And when you're training hard, it's really important to um, to emphasize the protein, especially um, like post workout. I know a lot of you will grab um, your protein on the way out, and that's a really really important time. That's a really important window to get your protein too. Um, to make sure you're right. Yeah. Tissue. Okay, and then also to um, uh, like healthy fats. Like again, yeah, I, I don't. I'm more concerned, like I'd rather them get more of the micronutrients in them beforehand, like eating earth-grown food, all yeah. that stuff, and then worry about ratios, I don't really worry about ratios. Yeah, yeah I don't, yeah. Uh, but what about fat? Because I think a lot of people are often like put off by it because they're not quite sure what it does for their body. Yeah, you know? fat is really important. Fat is the foundation for um, how our body uh, makes uh, makes a lot of hormones. And so it's, and, and we have a lot of hormones floating around us. So it's an incredibly important piece. In the 90s, I think it was 90s, um, there was a real fear around, around fat. So everything went low fat, everything went fat free. Um, and I think we did ourselves a really big disservice then. There are, um, not all fat is created equal. So there are some fats like the, uh, from fried foods and from all those things that are just, you know, not good for us and we know that. Um, but 
any of your, your, your mostly your vegetarian fats are your, so your best ones. So like the avocado, the coconut oils, the olive oils, the nuts, the seeds, all of those are providing your body with really, really healthy fat. And they're incredibly important. They're, they're, um, they're something that I think is often really overlooked in people's diets. And what I find is that when people tell me, oh, I'm so hungry, you know, I had lunch and then I'm starving. I can't, I can't, like I can't, an hour goes by. Like you're either, you're missing one of two things. It's definitely not the carbs because in North America we certainly don't have an issue with carbohydrates. Uh, it's usually a fat or a protein. And, um, and I find a lot of times in women's diets, unfortunately, um, and it's a bit of a generalization, but it tends to be, uh, it tends to be fats that are sort of overlooked. I normally, so my recommendation for people is just make sure you have a fat with every meal and every snack. So you should get one, some element of your macronutrients. So you should always have a protein, a carb, and a fat with every meal. So I don't worry so much about, you know, how much and what. Just make sure you're getting some element, element of a fat in your diet with every, every meal and snack. I have one question that I'll, yeah. uh, I'll pipe down. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have a pretty large 6 a.m. crew and um, I, we had talked before about intermittent fasting. Yeah. It's something that um, you know I'm not saying everyone should do. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's all case by case, depending on energy levels. Yeah. But for our 6 a.m. crew, um, we often have to wake up at 5 a.m. or 5:30 yeah. wherever we get here. Um, what would your recommendations be um, for them coming on empty stomach training? If it's good, bad, or or what? Like some options. It's really individualized. Some people do well with it, and some people don't. Some people, if they if they they're, like can't handle their blood sugar, like if their morning blood sugar is already like a bit low to then go and exercise, they're not going to feel well. So for those people, I would say just have something that's like already easy to digest, like a small uh, smoothie or something that's already sort of broken piece down, of piece of fruit, um, something that's easy. Some people do okay with it, uh, but it's that's a little more individualized than. I, um, I, yeah. I like to do a lot of intermittent fasting, so uh, for people who have a lot of injuries, it's, there's a lot of research on its ability uh, when we fast to really drop inflammation in the body. So uh, it's an important thing when we're recovering from an injury or for any of my autoimmune patients, really trying to keep the inflammatory levels down is to have that level of fasting. So for those people, I wouldn't worry too, too much um, about coming and, and working out as long as their body can tolerate, as long as they don't have blood sugar issues. You guys will know as trainers, like if people are you'll like, see it. you'll you see it, you'll feel it, it as, as, as athletes, yeah, you guys right? will feel it as athletes and when you're working out, like if you just don't have the stamina you have when you work out at five o'clock, 5 p.m., it's likely because you need something before uh, before your morning workout. But some people do fine. Some people can really push through. So, okay, so to follow up on that, yeah. my, my, based on the first two weeks, my, you know, looking at my food blog at this point, my issue is breakfast. Okay, I, yeah. I'm early morning with these guys. Great. And, then, and my breakfast sucks. Right? Okay. So, but I need to eat. If I, yeah. if I, don't, if yep. I come here and I don't eat, I'm ready to have a class so every yeah. right? Yeah. So, so t can you tell me what, I know what a smoothie is, but what yeah. is a smoothie? What is a smoothie? So, yeah, uh, great, so smoothie ingredients of a smoothie, like a great smoothie. Yeah. Uh, I would do a bunch of berries in there, so some fruits. I pick berries because they're sort of a low sugar fruit. Um, you could do half a banana in there. I would throw a handful of spinach just to get some greens. I would use a non-dairy milk, so either an almond milk or a cashew milk or any of the sort of non-dairy milks. Uh, protein powder, and then I would add a fat in there. So either like a couple tablespoons of ground flax seeds, and flax oil, a nut butter, avocado, just something of like that. So you're getting those three elements of your macronutrients. Okay, so so what I have now yeah. that I'm gonna yeah, incorporate at this point um, is uh, hemp hearts, kale, and carrots. Okay. That's kind of like yeah. thumbs up. Yeah. Thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> Sort of a carbohydrate rating on terms of how much sugar they have. 
Um, so the tropical fruits are like highest on the GI index, glycemic index, which is what we, we I talk about this all the time when I talk to my diabetic patients or pre-diabetic patients because this is really important for them to understand where a carbohydrate sits because not all carbohydrates are created equal. Uh, so your tropical fruits fall the highest on the glycemic index, whereas your berries, your apples, your pears are lower and everything else is sort of in the middle there. So, but otherwise, your smoothie sounds. Yeah, your headphones are going to be fat, which is good. Yeah, so you got that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about eggs. Yeah. Um, if you were to say boil a dozen eggs and just have a couple every morning, is that? Yeah. You know, some people have the taboo around eggs yeah. and the cholesterol egg. level, and yeah. should you take out the egg yolks and no, just no, have the whites? Egg, eggs get a really, really bad rap. Um, eggs are a fantastic source of protein. Um, yes, they have cholesterol in them. Um, but what we have, if somebody has an issue with cholesterol, um, it is only 20% is coming from their diet. So from the red meat, from the eggs, from, the, um, from those foods that actually have cholesterol themselves. 80% is actually coming from foods that don't contain cholesterol that are creating an environment for my body to want to make more cholesterol. So if I'm eating a lot of sugar or white flour or processed foods, it's my liver that makes cholesterol and it is going to pump out a lot of it if I'm eating a lot of those foods. So the 20% from the eggs and a little bit we might get from red meat, not the problem. The bigger problem is the flour, the, the sugar, the processed foods. So um, when somebody is cutting these out, um, if somebody has a known cholesterol issue, then I'll get them to cut this out. I'll get them to be mindful of this for a little bit. When we get their cholesterol under control, I'm like, add the eggs back in. Not a problem. For the average person, not a problem. I just had one other thing because I was, I was always a, a heavy soda pop drinker yeah. and drank a lot of Diet Pepsi. Trying to get off of that, mm -hmm. so but I like the carbonation, so drinking a lot of Perry and awesome. Santa Paula yeah, awesome. But I've heard a lot of people say that's a negative thing because it's not good for the carbonation for your bone density. So that, that, that's the truth. So yeah. uh, when it comes to carbonation, it does leach a little bit of calcium from your bones. Yeah. It's nothing like a diet pop would or a pop with sugar because when we have we have the carbonation plus the sugar, we are leaching a lot from our bones. Um, so I would argue that if that's the, the thing you need to get off of it, I wouldn't worry about it. It's better to get off of it, really, yeah. than the small detriment that it would do um, for your bones. Yeah. The one thing on the, sort of back to the eggs, is just uh, one thing that I find some people get in a, in a habit of is eating the same foods every day. So I really try and encourage people to rotate your foods around. You shouldn't have the same breakfast every single day or the same lunch every single day because um, you can induce food sensitivities. So you can eat, if you eat foods all the time, eventually your body's gonna go, well hang on a second, and you can, you, that food can become an inflammatory food for you. Uh, so it's really important to, to rotate the diet. So yes, the eggs are good, but I wouldn't have those every a single morning. Yeah. Again, it's convenience, right? Right, yep. fair, no, yeah, yeah for sure. And it's not a process. And breakfast is challenging for protein. Like I find that with a lot of patients, they struggle. And that's just where protein powders are easy. Yeah. So you can do eggs one morning, protein powder the next, and pep parts another day, and just kind of rotate through. No, actually, I'm um, steam a dozen eggs every Sunday. Yeah. I put them in the steamer and then I go back to the fridge all week. So a lot of times I'll, in the morning, I'll wake up and I'll crack two eggs, put them in a bowl, chop them up, make like an egg salad sandwich. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll use mayonnaise, I'll use like one teaspoon just enough to yeah. bind it together. Yeah. And then put it on that, I, I guess it's um, stone mill bakeries. Okay, yeah, the bread. Yeah. And we'll make yeah. bread. Yeah. I find that's pretty quick and easy to Yeah, to yeah, yeah, it would be for sure. Yeah. I would say I hate to see a meal go by. So the comment was that uh, boil some eggs and then we'll make like an egg salad um, sandwich quickly uh, as a quick meal. And I say, uh, what I would say to that is like, I hate to see a meal go by without a fruit or a vegetable. So I would make sure there's a side well, yeah. salad with yeah. that or that there's something um, extra on that. And I find a lot of times um, with Maybe sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. Um, just being mindful that we're not just filling ourselves up on the two pieces of bread. It's really easy to go somewhere and have a sandwich and then get full on that. But now we're missing out on an opportunity to have more fruits, more vegetables, which would have more vitamins and minerals. And so it sets our, our body up for um, uh, for feeling better, stronger, um, having more energy, all those kind of things. Yeah. Um. What are your thoughts on veggie greens as opposed to like kale or spinach in a protein? Like a like a greens yeah. powder? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're a quick option and um, uh, I, I prefer the whole thing because you're gonna get a lot more fiber that way. Okay. Um, but in in a pinch if we don't have any in the fridge or somebody just um, likes to add that for extra, sure. But I always say it never replaces 
your greens. Like you can't just say, oh, I just have a scoop of greens in my smoothie and like, oh, forget that pyramid with all those greens at the bottom. I don't need to do that. I wouldn't say that it would replace it, but it's not it's not harmful by any stretch. But I get um, kids on it sometimes when I have yeah. like parents who are just at a loss in terms of how to get their kids to get enough fruits and vegetables. And I'm like, well, at least give them this. At least they're getting sort of something. But um, then I also say it's expensive vegetables, so they're just kind of dehydrated down. But yeah, it's fine. Fine to add that. Yeah. Diving uh, too deep, can you guys touch on like nutrient timing? Um, maybe like the window after training, as well as like, supporting your squashing theories, but like breakfast being the most important meal, don't eat after 7 o'clock, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, and limiting your fruit too, that's a big thing too, right? What's that? Yeah. Limiting your fruit. Yeah, yeah, so I think the big thing with timing is the most important thing I think when it comes to training is the protein uh, and afterwards. And I usually, they, the research, they'll say up to an hour, but usually it should be within the 15 to half an hour window if you can do it that quickly. That is that is best when it comes to protein. So that's the biggest thing when it comes to nutrient spacing. Um, as far as breakfast being the most important meal of the day, um, it breaks your fast, like it, yeah. it revs up your metabolism, so it gets that going. So that you know, that's that's sort of the, the theory behind that, and that's obviously really important. It raises your blood sugar levels when your blood sugars will be low, so it sort of it puts your biochemistry on sort of a, a better. And I think we're sort of told field. it's the best, the most important meal of the day because so many people miss it, <laughs> and so they're missing out on breaking that fast and leveling out their blood sugars. It's notoriously the worst meal. Uh, if you look at people's diet diaries, as I'm sure you all do, that um, a lot of people don't eat the most balanced breakfast, um, but I think I think we can we can spread it our nutrition over the day. I don't think we need to put it all into one meal. I just think um, people just need to have it. I and I think thing. the notion of the eat, don't eat after seven is just because people just snack at that time. They, so yeah, their it's, it's, it's always thrown around a weight loss circle in terms of like stop eating after. For for patients of mine who don't have a weight issue, I just say if you're hungry, eat. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, just choose wisely. Just choose wisely, and you don't necessarily want to eat and then go crawl right into bed. But I don't think we need to have sort of a hard cut off. Okay, but, so go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, there was a book that came out a few years ago called the Eight Hour Diet. Okay. So you would eat from noon until eight, and then fast for sixteen hours every day. Yep. What are your thoughts on that? There's some really interesting research on fasting. I really don't think it's for everybody. I think you have to have really good blood sugar control. Um, I've prescribed it for patients who have a lot of inflammation or maybe have Crohn's or colitis where their digestive system just needs a break. Um, I've used it sometimes to help rev up people's metabolism a little bit when they just can't seem to lose weight. I'm like, we gotta do something, you know, all the things we're doing isn't working. I really don't think it's for everybody. Uh, I think some people like would feel awful in the morning and they would feel really irritable and they just wouldn't be able to function and their brains wouldn't work properly. Uh, so I don't think it's a good recommendation for everybody, but I think in certain populations, I don't think it's the worst idea. Yeah, can you guys just touch real quick on fat diets? I get asked often, like, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? And again, you guys know our system. Um, just maybe touch on uh, like how harmful they can be in terms of like stalling metabolism and sure. you know the quick fix versus like the sustainability of it. Yeah, yeah. that's that's one of the biggest um, things that I always say about fad diets is uh, whenever we're trying to make a, a healthy change, it's you want to do something that you can sustain or do long term. And so the challenge with a lot of these fad diets is that there, there's a there's a start point and there's usually an end point, and it's not something we're going to do long term. And so that's we're not teaching anybody to eat better. We're not teaching anybody how to eat well. And so that's one of the biggest detriments, I think, with fad diets. Um, and and I, you're not learning anything in the process. But you're also, oftentimes there's some fad diets that will like restrict, you know, one entire food group or one uh, macronutrient or whatever it is. And like our bodies are designed to handle all of these. So I think it's really about sort of a, a lifestyle and a balanced approach. And I think that that's uh, what you guys uh, recommend and what we do as well. It's just you know. When, Nutrition can be simple. Stick to your whole foods, and there's no there's no magic to it. Um, <clears throat> I struggle with buying meat, so I like roast out by most meat actually, so that's part of it. But yeah. also <laughs> like around the whole nitrates and yep. buying the ground like yep. ground beef and all that sort of stuff. So we don't actually eat red meat. Um, when we found the Alaskan, the wild Alaskan salmon at Costco. So yeah. I have like those okay. two staples we stick to. Great. But one of your recipes has 
sausage in it. So how do you buy, like I, Helenda's does a nitrate-free roasted turkey, yeah, and nitrate-free kielbasa. You can get organic, you can get organic ones. You wouldn't want to sauce like that <coughs> yeah, would have nitrates in it. That would have nitrates in it, but you can get organic sausages. Um, okay. So if it's organic, then you're avoiding all of those nasty chemicals. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I always buy organic meats, and they're they're getting better in the yeah. area. Like Costco has a lot of like or you can get the two like organic chickens, and they organic uh, chicken breasts now there. Organic chicken breasts there. Um, there's a little butcher in Pickering that has organic. They, that's where I get the organic butcher sausages. Butcher, butcher, butcher. Yeah, you've got a bunch of with Yeah, he's yeah. got tons of this way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I think we don't need. Sort of as much meat, so doing you know, I mean, cutting protein, back, but you can get it elsewhere. You can get it That's elsewhere, it. like yeah. easily. Uh, and if you're not a protein powder, it's a really easy way to make sure you're getting it. And yeah, I'm constantly encouraging people if it's in the budget, buy organic, especially with your meat sources. How is it cost us so much meat? Better? I know, <laughs> I know. It, it's it's crazy. It's so cheap. To but you know what? It costs you a lot to sauce for a whole family. I always say it costs you a lot to be sick too, though. Yeah, that's right. right? So. Just, if you're trying to get a population to eat better. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. there's got to be a shift. The, the one sort of good thing is that there's some big players that are kind of get like, now if you go to Walmart, there's a lot more organic stuff there, and so it's helping to drive the price down for some of these things. And so, you know, when we start to see some of that shift happening in the marketplace, that's kind of encouraging, because it'll hopefully help to drive the, the price down. But it is, no doubt, it's, it's, it's more expensive to eat well, but if I have, uh, if people eat processed foods, like where you go to the frozen food section, you buy the pre-made whatever it is, and you bring it home. It's actually that's equally as expensive. That costs a lot of money. Um, so when you're getting somebody off of that and getting them onto a whole foods where they have to cook, um, you can actually you won't notice a huge change in the grocery budget. We use Durham Organics, and they yeah, deliver yeah. a bin awesome. every awesome. day, every week to our house. So we you do the sixty dollar bin. Yeah. And we get a ton of food. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? For yeah. sixty bucks, it's a ton. Yeah. And then when we go to the grocery store, our bill is. So minimal yeah yeah and a lot of times because i'm spending so we spend so much money on organic food i find that i'm using every last ounce of every piece of product yeah, yeah you're like go back I'm <laughs> cooking it and freezing it yeah so absolutely i've actually we've saved money by yeah by right. using them i and find we're not running around to eight different grocery stores trying yeah. to find every organic piece of and product. you get so much more right like when you go to the grocery store sometimes like the big grocery stores will have like <laughs> half the things i want organic yeah and I'm like, we were i was driving it's around like six different places yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, it's and they have cauliflower this week for $4. Like, you oh. cannot find yeah, it anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. For five bucks, but that was not really good. It's organic cauliflower, four bucks. Yeah, that's good. Actually, the uh, Great Main Superstore had been two weeks ago at Levin's cheaper for their organic ones than their regular ones. Do you have a question, Matt? Yeah, on a scale of one to 10, how good is celery? Like, on a scale of one to ten, how good is celery? I'm going to give it a ten. I would say it's right up there. I would say it's right up there. Yeah. If your mom tells you to eat it, you should eat it. Yeah. I know this is Nutella. Nutella, you have the product. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very cringe. So, what do you use uh, in place of it? So, I've got four kids. Yeah. And my wife and I leave for both teachers. Yep. So we have to leave early in the morning because sure. our school starts at eight. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times they have to eat themselves. Yeah. Yeah. We're rushed, busy lifestyle. And I just, so my yeah. son goes crazy for Nutella. Yeah. But the problem is he was born with a diaphragmatic hernia, and like there were certain foods that he couldn't eat for a long time. Right. So. We found something that he could eat and something he would eat to help put weight on him. So yeah. now what I'm looking for is something healthy. Yeah, yeah. sure. Would, so what would you recommend? I would switch so, to like an almond butter. Yeah, um, I so also just saw today, actually, it's funny you said that. Um, today I just saw online a recipe to make your own Nutella that uh, had hazelnuts and it had cocoa powder and honey and it was like all whole ingredients and you just throw it in the blender. Um, mm -hmm. So you're going to avoid... So you could just Google like homemade Nutella and I'm sure you can come up with a much cleaner recipe or the nut butters are great, like yeah. the almond butters and that you can get hazelnut butter and um, things like that you would get be a much healthier with, with an almond butter than you and, would from. And spread it on for what? Uh, well, you could do it on toast, but that's kind of what you're suggesting, just like your, as your, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a whole grain, yeah, yeah. Smoothies are, are really quick too, and if you have a busy family with four kids, you could get um, the kids to kind of pitch in. I don't know how old they are, but get them to throw everything in the blender the night before, and you could even rotate. But the youngest is in grade three, so 
Okay. Well, you know, the they little help. They, 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 yeah. uh, they don't have to start it. They just have to throw the ingredients in there, and then as you just have to add the liquid in the morning and blend it, and it's it'd be quicker than anything else you're probably putting together. You just have to do the leg work the night before. Um, but you can get them sort of involved in, in picking and kind of coming up with their own creations, which I find a lot of times if you can get kids involved in the process, they get more excited about the process. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, I, re I really don't, it's really not more expensive. It really isn't more expensive. And the biggest one, that I know you guys said it, but I find that the, the key is preparation and planning. Yes. If yes. you don't have that, yeah. it's way harder yeah. to do any yeah. of this. Yeah. It's not hard to eat healthy. Yeah, you're right. But it's it's if you it's got to be ready and yeah. prepared, yeah. or yeah. else you can't. Absolutely. Did you guys hear that in the back? Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. And I think you guys well, and I did um, two weeks of vegetarian, so we just said, okay, we're not going to eat meat for two weeks, and often we'll do our preparing together. Uh, I was shocked at how cheap my grocery bill was. It was like. Nothing. It was yeah. so inexpensive. The minute you cut out meat, it's so much cheaper. So you can, you're absolutely right, you can eat healthy on a budget uh, and feed a family that way. And yeah, it, it's, um, I think you guys said it's a lot of time for your training, right? Which is fantastic. If you took a fraction of that time um, and just put it towards your meal planning, um, it'd go a long way. Complement it really nicely. Your diet's all good. Would you recommend a multivitamin at all to complement it? Or? No multivitamin necessary. It, it depends on the patient. Yeah. Not always. Like, it's not something I put every single patient on. No. Um, I will put some on it, but I don't put everybody on multivitamin. Especially if people have like good diets and good digestion. Um, there may not be a need unless I see a need sort of clinically where other nutrients are are lower than they should be. Then you know sometimes it's a nice sort of insurance package. But it's not something I. I, I really feel like if you're eating good foods, you should be able to get your nutrients from your food sources. That being said, to throw a multi in isn't going to hurt anybody. Um, yeah. Is there a protein powder that you would recommend, aside from BioSteel? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's not That good. is a good one. I don't like that one. Um, uh, we have a few at the clinic that we carry, one by... Douglas Labs, that's nice. Uh, I, for quick, easy accessibility for patients, I don't mind the Vega One, uh, the vegan, that vegan one. Um, yeah, it's not a bad one, actually. Which yeah. one? Which one? By, uh, by Genuine Health, it's not a bad one. Yeah, you just need to be careful, like if there's a dairy sensitivity, you don't want to do a whey protein, or if you're trying to be vegetarian, then you're going to want to choose vegetarian. So we want to look at how it's sweetened, right? Like, you yeah. don't want anything that's sweetened with, um, like, aspartame or any um, artificial sweeteners like that. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay in some of them, yeah. There's a couple of good papers out there on protein powders. Okay. And there's some that are some junk. Are, oh, for oh, sure. Oh, some are horrific. Some you're are awful. Big, you get what you pay you for. The, you get what you pay for, and you're going to go into the big stores in the mall. So the BioSteel one came up. Yeah, <laughs> 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 and there. Stop. And and there's some junk in there. Diesel came up. Yeah. Good? Okay. Yeah. So those, those are a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you get what you pay for, for sure. Yeah, unless you 